Hello, welcome back to part four of our look at the immune system. Uh, and in this video, we're going to get an introduction into uh, adaptive immunity. And so uh, what we've looked at so far, as far as immune response, has been the innate immune system. Uh, and we know that the innate immune system is a series of defenses by which you are born with. You don't have to do anything to um, utilize the defense system that is parts uh, that is a part of the uh, innate immune system. But adaptive immunity, uh, another name for adaptive immunity that you will see is acquired immunity. Uh, you do have to do something in order for you to be able to use it. And, and what you need to be able to do is be exposed. You have to be exposed to very specific antigens or proteins uh, that are either identified as not being self or being self, but they are irregular. They are different. Um, they don't function normally. And so they're the two criterion in order to uh, develop an acquired immunity or adaptive immunity response. Again, those antigens that are, uh, that are present within the body either have to be identified as not being self or they are self, but they are misformed or misshapen. They don't, they're not functioning uh, properly and they're identified as not, not being uh, uh, properly functioning. And so uh, that's the first thing that we need to keep in mind about adaptive immunity. The second thing that we need to keep in mind about adaptive immunity is that it is based off of previous exposure. And so uh, we have these T cells and B cells classified as lymphocytes. And uh, these T cells and B cells, through the process of gaining acquired immunity specific for an antigen, they develop memory cells, memory T cells and memory B cells. And these memory cells do just what they sound like they would. They remember previous exposure to antigens that were identified as either being not of self or being of self, but being um, misshapen or not, function not functioning properly. And so um, this ability to have this immune system that is acquired over time based off of exposure to antigens and have that immune system be able to adapt is what we define as being immunocompetent. Right? In other words, the immune system is able to go ahead and adapt to new exposures. Um, again, both T cells and B cells, as we know, are produced within the red bone marrow. And uh, it's within the red bone marrow where the B cells will mature. The T cells we know leave the red bone marrow as immature T cells and then travel to the thymus uh, and we'll talk about how they mature here in the thymus coming up. Um, and so, uh, as, I've, uh, as I've alluded to, um, T cells and B cells uh, develop this acquired or adaptive immunity or immunocompetence uh, in different ways, even though the end result is the same, and that is immunity. Uh, T cells undergo something that is referred to as cell-mediated immunity. Uh, and uh, I like to use the analogy that T cells uh, engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so to speak. Um, you're going to see this term, uh, that, and it's a term that we've used previously in earlier lectures, um, but you're going to see this, this notation. Right, T with this subscripted C, uh, which is a cytotoxic T cell. Uh, and what that means is 
that these are uh, these are immune cells. These are lymphocytes that are going to basically uh, dock or anchor onto uh, a cell that has antigens not of self or are abnormal, and they're going to release um, perforin which is going to perforate the membrane and they're going to release granzymes, which is going to cause uh, extracellular fluid to rush in and it's going to initiate this whole process of apoptosis. Um, and so it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? T cells engage in this hand-to-hand -hand combat, whereas B cells, whereas B cells undergo what we call antibody mediated immunity. Uh, another word for antibody-mediated uh, immunity is humoral immunity. Either term is correct, um, but what is involved, what it is, what is involved is the production of antibodies. And so what will happen is your B cells uh, will be programmed to produce a specific antibody that is specific for an antigen uh, and the antibodies mark they, they kind of cluster around that cell and mark it for disposal it marks it for destruction um, and so two very different pathways in which uh, adaptive immunity happens and so uh, what's going to happen over the next few uh, PowerPoints uh, or uh, videos is uh, we're going to look at exactly how this happens. But before we do that, uh, we have to have some more basic understanding of what is what is happening here. And so uh, let's go ahead and jump into that. All right. By the way, this right here is just a um, kind of a map of where B cells and T cells uh, gain their maturity right, and where they function. And so uh, B cells we know um, are uh, produced within the red bone marrow and they mature in the red bone marrow. And that's exactly what you're seeing right here. From the red bone marrow, uh, B cells go into circulation. And so they go into the uh, lymph nodes uh, where they wait for activation or they circulate through the cardiovascular system and the uh, vasculature, the arteries and the veins, and they wait for activation. Whereas T cells, right, again, cellular immunity, they're produced within the red bone marrow, but they have to go to the thymus to mature. And then they once again will function we, uh, either in the lymph nodes or they will function uh, circulating throughout the cardiovascular system. So uh, this is exactly what we're going to be looking at and talking about here in the rest of this lecture is how do T cells gain maturity. Um, and so uh, we already know, kind of recapping what we know, that um, there's a variety of hormonal regulations, right? whether it is leukopoietin, whether it is uh, interleukins um, that are stimulating the differentiation of those pluripotent stem cells within the red bone marrow. Right? And the differentiation uh, will now differentiate those pluripotent stem cells into lymphoid cells, not myeloid cells, but lymphoid cells. And then from there, new T cells uh, at, will be developed. Now, interestingly enough, um, those um, epithelial reticular cells in the thymus that is producing thymosin um, and the other, uh, and uh, thymulin, um, and the other uh, hormones that are being released and produced by the epithelial reticular cells can actually stimulate this process as well. And so now we've got some other hormonal regulation, regulations going on 
uh, within here as well. But those T cells are going to be stimulated for production and differentiation by those pluripotent stem cells that we talked about last chapter. They're released into the blood, uh, undifferentiated, where they make their way to the thymus. And it's in the thymus where they actually undergo two tests. They undergo a positive selection test and they undergo a negative selection test. Um, and they have to pass both tests. If they don't pass both tests, then if they don't pass both tests, then they are marked for destruction and they undergo apoptosis, um, which is also regulated through those epithelial reticular cells. Um, and then they finalize their maturing within the medulla of the thymus. So uh, all of this, uh, all of uh, that negative selection and positive selection is taking place within the thymic cortex. And so this here is uh, an overview of the positive selection process. All right. And so the T cells, their first test is uh, they must be able to recognize a protein that is found on all cells except red blood cells. Um, and this protein is what we call a major histocompatibility complex, the MHC. Um, and there's two types, as we will discover. There is... Uh, MHC1, and there is also MHC2. And there's a difference between the both of them, um, and we'll get into that a little bit more here coming up on, on the next few slides. Uh, but the first step in T cells maturing is being able to recognize that major histocompatibility protein, or that MHC. So it has to recognize the self protein. All right. Uh, if if the developing T cell does not, does not recognize the major histocompatibility protein, then that cell is marked for death, apoptosis. Right, and so that is what you're seeing. Uh, that is what you're seeing right here. So uh, this T cell right here, this maturing T cell, uh, is not recognizing this MHC right there. It's not recognizing that MHC. Um, and so this is actually misformed or misshapened. Right. This receptor right here is not what is what is not functioning. So it's not recognizing it. And so this cell right here would be marked for destruction. This cell down here is properly recognizing the self major histocompatibility complex, and so this cell survives. And it goes on to the second test. The second test is negative selection. All right. So now, can now that we've we've passed the MHC test, um, can this developing T cell? recognize this antigen as being a self-antigen. And so here's the antigen right there. And it is a self-antigen. So it is an antigen that belongs to you. And so this right here is a self-antigen. And uh, if it recognizes this self-antigen, if it recognizes this self-antigen, that means it's going to go ahead and react to it and respond to it. We actually don't want it to pay attention to this. All right. And so if it says, ah, yep, okay, uh-huh, I recognize this, we're going to attack, All right. then that cell now goes through apoptosis. And so this is a fail. All right. But if, because that means that when it gets exposed out into the blood from this antigen, it's going to go ahead and try to attack it. We don't want that to happen. Right? That's why recognizing it is not a good thing. But if, if this developing T cell looks at that self-antigen and it says, I don't have any clue. That is not something that I am supposed to recognize. All right. um, 
And then what ends up happening is uh, the T cell survives. Now, 98% of the developing T cells fail to recognize or fail to pass either step one, MHC recognition, and or step two, uh, self-antigen recognition. It, it fails that test, 98%. Only 2% will pass both the MHC recognition and the negative selection test. All right, now in B cells, we kind of see the same process um, as far as um, recognition. All right, but again, maturation occurs within the bone marrow. All right. Um, and again, uh, the way that we get that humoral uh, immunity or the immunity through antibodies is one of two ways. We can get it active all right, immunity or we can get what we call passive immunity. And again, these this is strictly for B cells. All right, so this is humoral immunity. And so this is B cells only. And so if it's active immunity, right, naturally acquired means you've actually come in contact with the pathogen and your B cells have been stimulated to develop antibodies specific for that, the antigens of the pathogen. Right? And so that's active. In other words, the B cells are actually working to create the antibodies. Um, now, artificially acquired humoral immunity is what happens through vaccines. Right. Whether the vaccine is dead or attenuated, uh, attenuated means weakened. And so what they do is they take away the pathogenic parts of the virus, um, but you are still reacting to the antigens that are very much alive um, or at least active. Right. And so that is active humoral immunity. Right. Either you come directly in contact with the pathogen and therefore you come in direct contact with the uh, antigens and you create the antibodies or you're exposed through um, vaccine. Passive, passive uh, is uh, what you are getting from your mother during fetal development. Right? And so actually the, some antibodies can cross the placental barrier. Um, and so you gain some, na uh, some naturally acquired uh, immunity from your mother during fetal development. Um, the other way is uh, through uh, antibodies being injected directly into you. Right? And so the reason why that's passive is because your body's not actually making those antibodies. Um, what you're doing is you are uh, you're, you're ingesting or injecting those antibodies already pre-made for you. Um, and, and you would have to continuously take that. This is kind of how antibiotics work uh, in a sense. T cells are completely predicated. T cells are predicated on gaining their immunity through something that is referred to as an APC. Uh, it is an A, P, C, an antigen presenting cell. Right? And so T cells are working off of this antigen presenting cell. It has to work in conjunction with it. Um, and, and so T cells don't just randomly come up against uh, an antigen. Uh, that antigen has to be brought to it. Right? And as we've already talked about, what is going to bring, what is responsible for carrying the antigen is the major histocompatibility complex. Right? And it's a protein on the surface of um, all cells except red blood cells. And so we have um, your body cells, you have your self cells, and you have also these APC cells, both of which carry major histocompatibility complex proteins. Uh, and the idea is that these MHC proteins identify every cell in the body with the exception of red blood cells as self, as belonging uh, 
uh, to the individual. Um, and they kind of work as I, I like to, I like to use the analogy of if, if you have cats, um, cats are evil. Cats are the spawn of Satan. Um, they are devious, mischievous, uh, constantly plotting and planning your death. Um, but they pretend to love you. They're, they're the epitome of evil. Um, and, and to kind of prove that, uh, if, if you've ever had a cat, an outdoor cat or a cat that uh, is indoor but gets out, um, it very often to show its love and appreciation for you, uh, it will go out and kill something and bring it back and drop it at the doorstep and meow until you come and acknowledge this love gift that it has graciously gone out and violently killed, draining the life from it and uh, giving that to you uh, to show its affection and love. Um, uh, we, we, if that was a person, we would lock them up and, and call them a serial killer. Um, but if it's flirt, if it's a furry with a tail and meows, uh, we, we, we call it a pet and love it and keep it and, and say, look how cute it is. Um, cats are evil. Um, but think of the cat as bringing the dead thing to your doorstep to show you, uh, what the, it's, it's analogous to what the APC is doing with the T cells. It's going in and the APC is the cat and it finds an antigen, which is the dead thing. And it's bringing it to the T cell, just like the cat brings the dead thing to you for approval. Hey, look what I found. Ah, oh, isn't it great? I love you. Yes. Um, that's what the APC is doing with, with the T cells and the antigens. All right. Um, now there are, and, and this is where things get a little tricky. There are two types of MHCs, and, and I've alluded to this now multiple times. And so let me demystify, so to speak, this mystery. Uh, you have MHC1 proteins, and we have MHC2 proteins. Uh, MHC1 proteins are on, are, are uh, uh, located on all cells except red blood cells. And by all cells, I mean all cells, including APC cells. So APC cells have MHC1 proteins as well as every cell in the body having MHC1 proteins, and, except for red blood cells. Um, MHC2 proteins are only displayed, only found on APCs, on antigen-presenting cells. All right. Um, now, uh, what are antigen presenting cells? Well, examples of them can be dendritic cells. Um, some macrophages will act as antigen presenting cells and, hope you're sitting, B cells are also antigen presenting cells. All right. And so B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells are examples of antigen presenting cells that would have both MHC1 and MHC2 proteins um, that are uh, uh, found on them. Um, what's the difference? Why, why, why the difference in class? Well, MHC1 proteins, MHC1 proteins work to identify what we define as being endogenous antigens. That's a big word. Endogenous antigens. What's an endogenous antigen? Uh, it is an antigen. It is a protein that comes from within the cell. And so let's say you've got a virus that has infected a cell. It's going to go ahead and it's going to have an antigen associated with it. All right. And the MHC on the cell membrane is actually going to grab a piece of that antigen and mark it and then get its way to the T cell. 
and say, hey, is this really a pathogenic antigen? All right. Um, if a antigen, if a protein uh, is turning cancerous inside of a cell, it's going to grab that and it's going to grab it and lock onto it and bring it to the T cell and say, hey, is this antigen unusual itself, but is it unusual? Um, and so that is how uh, MHC1 proteins work. All right. Um, so any kind of viral infection, any kind of bacterial toxin, all right, within a cell, uh, any kind of abnormal protein and or cancerous protein um, that is now located within a uh, somatic cell, a cell of the body, those MHC1 proteins are there to identify the abnormality. Uh, whereas MHC2 proteins are going to be um, exogenous. MHC2 proteins are going to be exogenous. Uh, oh, oh. Sorry about that. It went crazy. Um, is going to be, my God, it looked like a, a fourth grader got a hold of my, uh, or two-year-old got a hold of my thing. Uh, let's try this again. Um, it is going to be exogenous uh, antigens. And what that means is extracellular antigens or antigens that is now floating around the lymph and or the plasma, right? The lymph and or the plasma. And so bacterial toxins. So when the bacteria die, they're going to release toxins into the plasma and or into the lymph. Um, parasitic worms are going to have antigens associated with them. Pollen, dust, viruses, uh, all of these things will be handed or will be handled by an antigen presenting cell, uh, which has the MHC2 protein. And so very distinct functions. Remember, APC has both MHC1 and MHC2, right? whereas your somatic cells only have MHC1 proteins. Um, and the reason why this is important is because MHC1 proteins stimulate T cell activation through what we call um, CD8 pathways, something we're going to talk about in the next lecture, whereas uh, MHC2 uh, proteins associated with the APC uh, is going to stimulate CD4 pathways, All right. and that CD that you see there simply means um, classification determinant. Classification determinant. So it's going to determine the pathway by which the T cell is going to take in order to gain specific or adaptive um, or acquired immunity. And that is probably more than what you ever wanted to know about antigen presenting cells, um, but it is important. It is important. All right. um, one last slide that I want to leave off with. Okay, I lied. Um, by the way, this here is just a summary table of MHC1 and MHC2 proteins. All right. And so you can look over that. That's a really good summary table. Um, last slide that I want to talk about, uh, and that is your types of T cells that you're going to have. Um, you have your cytotoxic cells, right? what I like to refer to as your killer T cells. Right? And that's actually what's going to be doing the destroying or the, or the destruction of uh, the pathogenic cell. Right? Um, but you also have helper T cells. Right? And your helper T cells really are there to help coordinate um, your B cells as an antigen presenting cell. Right? And so your B cells can actually stimulate T cell proliferation or the production of your T cells. And the way that they do that is with 
these helper T cells. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the fact here that um, your helper T cells is actually three different kinds that we'll, we'll differentiate out here. Um, you also have regulatory T cells. Uh, these regulatory T cells, we believe, are part of Hassel's corpuscles or the thymic corpuscle. Um, and they are stimulated by the epithelio reticular cells that are found within the thymic corpuscles. Uh, and then you have these memory T cells as well. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about this being the cells that are there to um, uh, direct the remembrance of an antigen. Uh, and as we will learn, that will uh, expedite an immune response the next time that the body encounters that antigen. Uh, and so what were our three helper T cells that I wanted you to be aware of. Uh, they are helper T cell one, helper T cell two, and helper T cell 17. Uh, what do each of those do? Um, Helper T cell one uh, is what is actually going to uh, directly manipulate the T cell to go ahead and build immunity. Um, and so it's more of a generalist. It's just, it's, it's a broad ranged helper T cell. It doesn't matter what it is. It's going to go ahead and facilitate that T cell to differentiate. Uh, helper T cell two uh, is specific for things like parasitic worms, um, it's going to stimulate eosinophils, uh, and it's going to um, stimulate B cells as well. Right? So your helper T cells, your TH2s, your helper T cells 2, um, are specifically geared towards parasitic worm infections. Uh, it's going to stimulate the activation and the production of eosinophils, and it's also going to uh, activate uh, antibody response or humoral response. And then uh, helper T cell 17 uh, is going to actually help with the release of interleukin 17. All right. And that stimulates the innate immune system. And so that's going to stimulate things like your natural killer cells. That's going to stimulate things like vasoconstriction, vasodilation, bronchial constriction. Um, that's going to stimulate things like your neutrophils. Uh, it's going to stimulate basophils. It's going to stimulate mast cells. And so helper, uh, helper T cell 17 or, or TH17 um, has more of that regulatory role over the innate immune system. And so you can see that we kind of span, we, we fan out our regulation and control. It's not just the T cells that are going to be active. Depending on how severe the infection is, uh, we're going to trigger a cascade of events that is happening throughout. And again, those cytotoxic cells, those, those TC cells, um, are your traditional T cells. And again, they're going after things that are virally infected cells, um, cells that have parasites or bacteria within them. It's going to attack those cells. Uh, cancer cells, it's going to attack those. Um, any kind of transplanted tissue or transfusion. So think of your ABO blood groups and your RH groups. Um, your cytotoxic cells are going to go ahead and stimulate a... Um, uh, a response towards them, um, and they're going to use the exact same mechanisms that our natural killer cells are using in that it's going to release perforin and the granzymes uh, to cause apoptosis. Um, and so in, in that case there, uh, even though natural killer cells are part of the innate immune system, uh, these cytotoxic T cells are very specific. They're, they're targeting very specific cells.
all right, instead of being a part of that innate immune system. Um, and so with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and stop. We're going to hit pause. Um, we're going to give you some time to chew through uh, all of this information, uh, review it, answer your questions. You're going to go through and um, jot down questions that you may have for me and uh, get more and more comfortable with uh, this content before we move on to specifically looking at T cells and B cells. Um, and so uh, with that, um, keep studying, keep reviewing, and I'll catch you on the flip side.